Mr. Medin here again, you guys, Mr. M. And this time, we're gonna go into some physics and we're gonna talk about target interactions. So there's a difference between target interactions and interactions with matter. Interactions with matter are your photoelectric, your Compton, that's gonna happen with the patient. But when we talk about target interactions, think about it. These are interactions with the target itself. Now, what's another term for target that we use? We say anode, correct? So I like to just say these are anode interactions. So these are interactions occurring with the anode. So there's only two. There's Bremsstrahlung and there's characteristic. You can find this in chapter 8 of the principles book, and it's going to be found on page 118, 119. So we have Bremsstrahlung, right, and we have characteristic radiation. So we're going to draw here a focusing cup. We're going to draw two filaments. So this is a dual filament cathode. Now we know that the charge of the cathode is going to be what charge? It's going to be negative, correct? So this is negative. We talked about why it's negative, right? So I, I know I probably offended somebody, right? A 30 year old living at home still. Okay, so no, no, no judgment here, right? So the cathode is going to be negativity charged and it has to be negativity charged because you don't want the electrons hanging out there forever. They need to go, right? So this is going to be the cathode and on this end, this is the target. This is the anode. So remember that the anode has an angle, right? We call that a beveled edge the other day. So we have here the cathode and at the cathode, this is where we're going to have a large amount of current accumulating on one of the filaments, correct? So you have MA going to one of the filaments and you're going to have a bunch of electrons hanging out. They're hanging out, they're having a good time, they're all rubbing up against each other, they're causing friction. We call that heat, right? So what do we call that heat that's built up on the filament? Thermionic emission, that's right. So thermionic emission is here, space charge, space cloud, right? So this is going to occur here. Now remember that you have thermionic emission here, and on the other side, you have the anode spinning at a high velocity. It's going to want to go ahead and pull the electrons across, correct? So when you hit that exposure button, we said it releases the electrons. They're going to go in one stream, unobstructed, because there's a, they suck at all the air, there's going to be a vacuum. The vacuum allows the unobstructed path to electrons to travel at half the speed of light. They're going to fly. Now imagine, half the speed of light. You guys know how fast that is? That's 93,000 miles per second. That's freaking quick. And what do we say? If you're driving in your car and you have to put the brakes on, what's going to happen to your body? You're going to put the brakes on, but your body's going to continue, correct? So these electrons that are flying are going to have to put the brakes on. So when they're flying at half the speed of light, they're going to interact with the atoms of the tungsten. Tungsten, I think it's number 74 on the periodic table. It's a, it's a heavy metal. It's very dense. It can withstand a lot of heat, right? It's a high conductive of, uh, of metal. It's going to withstand a lot of the impact of the electrons. So what I'm going to draw is, you guys, these are known as incident electrons incident electrons, we're just going to call them E's, they're going to fly and they're going to interact with the atoms of the tungsten. So you have an incident electron flying at half the speed of light and you're going to interact now with the tungsten atom. And what model do we use? We use Bohr's model, right? The model here, like the solar system, right? So remember inside you have a neutron and a proton. And then you have orbiting electrons, correct? That creates an electromagnetic field. So there's a, there's, a, there's a protective barrier around the nucleus, right? And that's a strong electromagnetic field around the nucleus. So when the electrons are flying, guess what? That force field around the nucleus is gonna cause the electrons to put on the brakes and it's gonna veer off. It's gonna veer off. But guess what? Because it's traveling at half the speed of light, because it veers off, it's going to create a wave of energy. In class, I said my hand is the incident electron. The student is the force field, right? We said the force field was a lost student because they got hit, right? So that force field, you guys, is protecting that, that nucleus, right? My hand is the electron. I'm going to come across, but I'm going to go ahead and go off. And when I do that, you can feel the wave of energy. But because it happens at the subatomic level here, you guys, it creates a wave of energy. And the wave of energy was known as a Brems ray. It's Bremsstrahlung. 
So it's a sudden deceleration of electrons, right? That's gonna go ahead, it's gonna put the brakes on. Brems breaking, strong radiation, it puts the brakes on. Breaking radiation, Brem Shalom, sudden deceleration of electrons, creates a wave of energy, and it's known as a Brems ray, or known as the Brems Shalom method. It is the primary method of X-ray creation inside the X-ray tube. So notice I said primary. So if there's a primary, there's gotta be another one, right? So that's gonna be characteristic radiation. And I'm gonna explain exactly how these two are gonna happen. So, tungsten, high atomic number, right? Made up of atoms. You have electrons that are gonna be flying at half the speed of light. They're gonna to wanna to interact with the tungsten. They're gonna veer off and they're gonna create a wave. They didn't know what to call it back then, so they called it X-ray. So, <coughs> this is Brems ray. So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and give you another example. We have the incident electron flying, but this time, this time, we have the nucleus, the proton. Here's your K-shell. Now, you know that the K-shell is the, the first shell, right? It's the inner shell. So now, the K-shell electron is going to become ejected. So this incident electron is gonna eject, it's gonna eject the inner shell electron. So it's gonna create a vacancy. So now the L and the M, let's say, the L says, hey, I wanna jump into that spot. So there's a higher energy jumping into a lower energy. The difference between it now is gonna create a characteristic ray. It's gonna go ahead, we said this is like leapfrog, right? So you have these outer shell electrons jumping in. We said if one of you guys got up and you left, you'd wanna take their spot, and the next person would jump into that spot, and they do that spot, and the room will create heat. But at the atomic level, right, we're creating characteristic radiations. So when these electrons are jumping from one energy level to the next, we call this cascading. We call this cascading. So the cascading is the event. The result of the event is known as characteristic rays. Characteristic radiation. So how is it that both of these events can happen? Well, it's all dependent upon the KV that we use. So this K shell, remember there's voltage that keeps these things combined, EVE and voltage, correct? The K shell voltage, is 69.5 volts, electron volts. So, if you go above 69.5 kV, such as 70 kV, now you have enough power to knock out that inner shell electron, all right? So, I'm gonna write this on the board. If you are using below 70 kV, you're gonna have 100% Brems rates created. You see that? Now, if you go above 70 kV, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have 15% is gonna be characteristic. And that means, if we do the math, how many Brems rays are we gonna have? We're gonna have 85. So we have 85% will be Brems. So these interactions are dependent upon the kV that we're using. If it's below 69.5 kV, it doesn't have enough energy to knock out that inner shell electron within the tungsten, the K shell of the tungsten. So I, I still, <laughs> you know, poor guy who discovered this, right? He, when, when, he, when he found out about the structure of the atom, he's like, no, I'm gonna call it K shell and I give myself some room. But then he found out there were no other energy levels, so we got stuck with K, right? So I always wonder, why can't this be A, right? And then C, but it's not, K is the number one. So. Bremsstrahlung is gonna occur 100% of the time if you're using below 60.5 kV. If you go above 70 kV, you're gonna end up with characteristic as well. But remember, we said that Bremsstrahlung is the primary interaction that's gonna occur, correct? So, do we really care in the field of what extras are being created? No. We get the patient, correct patient, correct heart. We're cordial, we're respectful, we try to do it with the least amount of pain and discomfort that we can do. We set our mass, our KV, get our distance, and we make the exposure. 
You're not thinking about parental uncharacteristic. But when you guys get out there in the field and you guys are doing clinical rotations, I want you to think about characteristic and Bremshalon because you're going to think about it, you're going to have more recollection of that event that's occurring, all right? But as a tech in the field, we don't think about this. But this is the difference between Bremshalon and characteristic, all right? Cool? All right, thank you guys.